Hello and welcome to Surviving Scientology Radio, a podcast devoted to exploring Scientology. Today we have with us Jesse Prince. Jesse, welcome to the show. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for welcoming me to the show. Jesse, always love having you here. One thing we discussed in our, our last interview, Jesse, was David Miscavige is not a, a technical person. That is, he doesn't know the technology of Scientology. Correct. Never has, never has alluded to it at all, ever. No, and that's a real fascinating out point. Uh, when you hear Christian leaders, Billy Graham, Rick Warren, I mean, you just go down the list of prominent Christian leaders in America, they will talk about their prayer life, their relationship to Jesus Christ, their struggles. They talk about their exercise of faith. The point is, Ms. Miscavige, I've never heard him talk about a win he's had in session. Well, you know, he used to talk about how um, Scientology audited and got rid of his asthma. And then his asthma came back about 10 or 15 times, so he stopped talking about that. But um, he doesn't have any any Scientology experience. He doesn't. He he is not the one that has audited anyone that has helped anyone become clear, or helped anyone get up the bridge, or personally listen to anyone, empathize with anyone enough to uh, get them through any of the auditing processes. He he just hasn't done that. He can't. He can't do it. He doesn't know how. He does is what you how. Saying. Which leads me to ask, how does David Miscavige become the case supervisor of Lisa McPherson? Well, that's the rube right there. You know, I I did not understand that until I saw that article with uh, Tom DeVock in it. That Miscavige would act would actually do that. I mean. I would automatically assume he would know better than to even try it because Elron never ever asked him to audit anyone, to ever put anyone on an e-meter and ask him a single question. He, it was already known that that was not his area of expertise or within his ability to successfully do. So to see him doing something like that, and, you know, when I read the details about him saying something about, uh, uh, her e-meter needle or something, which is another thing he knows nothing about, and deciding that she's clear. I mean, by dem he dem demonstrated how clueless he is by even attempting to do these things without being trained and um, and just having the arrogance of thinking he can get away with it. I mean, look what happened. Well, certainly uh, the senior case supervisor in National Ray Mitoff is not going to stand in Miscavige's way. No, he, no. So when we're talking about the death of Lisa McPherson, which was just horrendous, brutal, agonizing. Yeah. Considering you had a healthy woman, okay, she lost her mind a little bit, you know, but you had a physically healthy, healthy woman, but 17 days later she is dead, dead, dead. I mean, HIV doesn't do that. Cancer doesn't do that. What kills you that damn quick? 17 short days to go from a, a physically healthy person to dead. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, well, the consensus is that they had left her, if they had left Lisa at the emergency room to get the proper medical uh, and psychiatric care she needed, uh, she would still be with us today. Well, the, Joan Woods, the medical examiner, her original diagnosis before she was descended upon by Scientology Legal and Intelligence Department, her original prognosis or, or cause of death of Lisa McPherson was severe hydration. They locked her in that hot-ass room, probably no air conditioner, no nothing, locked her in the room, ignored her, no water. So dehydration. That was the, that was the diagnosis. That's what Joan Wood said. She died of dehydration. Neglect. Now, how did you get involved in the Lisa McPherson case? I, um, it's funny. I, I became involved in that case through Stacey Brooks and Bob Minton. Bob Minton became involved in the case 
and you know, I didn't understand why, you know, how he, a person of his stature means got involved in it. But uh, I kind of explained that in the book. He told, and he tells me a little story about a time when he was held against his will and locked up and no one helped him. And that was a, a key point of why he was so upset about what happened with Lisa or empathized with it because he himself had had a, an experience like that. And, um, and then, you know, no one else could do it. You know, when you go into court with Scientology and you start questioning them about their ways, then they talk about their technology being uh, exclusive and religious in nature. And, you know, you can't judge it and it's belief, blah, 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 blah. But <laughs> because I've been so trained in it that even, I can take them to task on their technology. And what has happened in pretty much every case I've ever testified against them, I show where they're not following the technology, but doing something else, which is they have no excuse for. And, and Scientology's retort is always to change the conversation to personal attack or, or some, something else. They never talk about the issue itself. Well, that's Elrond Hubbard's policy, uh, attack the attacker. Yeah. Just one thing Hubbard wrote that's uh, of interest to me, he, he's making a list of things that don't work. This is, I think, in responsibility of leaders, perhaps. But he's saying what doesn't work is talking about us. Uh, let's talk about them, you know, welcome an investigation into them. Right. <laughs> attack the attacker. Exactly. Change, change the dialogue. So Miscavige was case supervising Lisa McPherson and she dies. He clearly is not going to accept responsibility for the death of Lisa McPherson. No, but then it was covered up by God knows who. I mean, I, I wrote that uh, declaration based on probability, based on who was responsible for what. And, and I came to those conclusions about those people that would have been involved if they were in those positions. Um, I, I know I, I specifically named Ray Medoff, but, um, you know, I later found out that shit in uh, David Miscavige was the case supervisor, you know. Now, what does a case supervisor do in Scientology? Could you explain that to our listeners? Sure. Um, sci uh, uh, Scientology technology is all about procedure, procedure and ritual routines. And a case, a case supervisor primary, primary job is to ensure that the auditor followed the rituals or the procedures exactly as written. That's what they do. Well, going down to the next level, when a Scientologist, L. Ron Hubbard said that everyone has a case. What does it mean to have a case in Scientology? What is my case? How is it different from your case? What is a case? Well, that's a good question. And, you know, and even in, in non-Scientology terms, it's like state of, state of mental health. What are you thinking? Um, where are you at on the grade chart? I mean, it has multiple meanings in Scientology. But primarily it means where are you at mentally in relationship to the grade chart? What have you completed? What do you still have left to com complete? What grade or level are you in? And that means that you're in a certain category and that uh, categorizes your, your state of mind or ability. Like uh, uh, an example is if your communication uh, attested to, you know, uh, grade zero, then you're com free on communication on diff different uh, areas of life. You really, if you're a grade one uh, uh, release, that means that you can effectively deal with problems. And at grade two, you know, the overt uh, motivated sequence, you're, you're free of that. Um, you know, all the different levels have their little accomplishments. And so in Scientology, you're basically trying to handle your case. Right, you're right. Mm -hmm. And and as you handle all these uh, things on your case, you'll work your way up and restore your native abilities as a Thetan. 
So basically, it's it's deductive. You're trying to get stuff out of the way as you handle your case. Right. And so the case supervisor then is is the correct term programming your case? Well, they okay. in the, they program it based on the procedure. You know, the 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 procedure in Scientology, the procedure is common for everyone. Everyone goes through the procedure, and it's just a, a matter of monitoring programming and then monitoring the progress of the procedure and so the if procedure you're on, is the grade chart okay so they're just they're just taking you on the steps to the grade chart on the bridge to total freedom right. now lisa this is controversial maybe you can bring some clarity to it I, apparently lisa mcpherson attested to the state of clear uh -huh. Now, was this something that Miscavige, as a case supervisor, said she's a clear? What went on there? Well, you know, I I had the folders. The folders were turned over to me by order of the court when um, when I was in that case. And do you know there was no mention of Miscavige, period. They had taken all of that out of the worksheets. And the last three days of her confinement, and we're also missing there was so there's missing content from the uh, Lisa McPherson's folders that were turned over to you by the court absolutely any mention of Miscavige having anything to do with the case is missing period and you know Tom say oh yes and he was case supervising and giving instructions and talking about the needle and or giving orders and blah 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 there's no mention of that whatsoever in the folder what did they do wrong to Lisa? Is it is it the system of Scientology itself or Miscavige's case supervising? What what from your point of view, just as an opinion, what what went wrong? First off, the procedure itself is questionable. Even Elrond says you can't save them all. Some people die, and he speaks in uh, psychological terms like some have catatonia, some are manic. You know, you know, speak in psycho no one else can speak in those terms. He's the only one allowed to know psychology, psychiatry. But <clears throat> be that as it may, the procedure itself is questionable and is not 100% uh, 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 foolproof. Number two, given the procedure, the, pe the people themselves, the handlers are the ones that really determine whether or not the person is going to live or not. You know, if, if you, and, and I, I base that just on my own personal experience with, with watching one of these people that were like that. I mean, oh, my Jesus God. It's like, I, I, I don't know, man. You know, there, there's something that, that's unnerving to be around a person that's out of their mind or, you know, or, 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 or mentally deficient. It's unnerving to me to be around people like that, and uh, it's something I'm not accustomed to anyway. So to now have a person like that that's moving, you know, <laughs> fighting, biting, you know, and you have to care. Oh, my God, I went through like a month of, of, of that with a, a young lady, and um, having to make them drink, you know, like, hold them down, open their mouths, you know, or, or just cajole them, get them to sip through a straw. Just the patience it takes to get them to do the simplest of things to keep living is is very time-consuming, and you have to be dedicated to do it. You, I mean, you, you can't just ignore the person or pretend it doesn't exist. They take – it takes constant attention for people. And you're talking about – well, L. Ron Hubbard called it a psych break. Right. Nervous breakdown, psych break. And then Hubbard's treatment for that was the introspection rundown where you lock a person in a room and have no communication with them except for, what, notes under the door? And, or? and the auditing itself. I mean, that's what the introspection rundown is an auditing procedure. And what's the goal of it? To, to get a person out of the psych break? Yeah, to get them out of that state. And it and it all boils. I mean, it's you know theological, but it's all about the point of introversion. You know, his. You know, I I kind of write about it in the affidavit where 
Elrond thought this was right up there with one of the greatest discoveries uh, of modern times. He thought that this was the last reason to even have any psychology or psychiatry around because he has solved how to handle the insane. I mean, yeah, he said it would eliminate the need for psychiatry. Yeah. Yeah. This was like a huge breakthrough as far as he was concerned. He was hoping to get the um, Nobel Prize for it. Or, I mean, you know, but that was his delusion. Just, you know, just to make that part clear, he's busy thinking he needs to get a Nobel Prize. In the meantime, Miscavige is killing people with this damn thing. You know, it's just so the disconnect is amazing. And I think that Lawrence Wright in his book, Going Clear, the subtitle, Scientology and the Prison of Belief. Yeah. Because really, if you were not in Scientology and you weren't opposed to doctors uh, treating mental illness, uh, you would have someone in the hospital getting medical and psychiatric care. Exactly. People like that, they, they uh, you know, society knows what to do. They it's called Baker acting. A, a person that can no longer be responsible for themselves and is acting like that, they're uh, uh, they're gotten in and they're admitted and you know examined and try to find out what the hell's wrong with them. The hospital wanted to use the Baker Act to keep Lisa McPherson under involuntary uh, watch, and and it's really to help the person. When a person's out of their mind, you you you, you know you you isolate them, and we have the same laws here in California, and every state does. You don't want them to hurt themselves or others. And part of the Baker Act is contacting someone who knows the person, trying to find someone to be responsible for them. It's not just to commit someone, but you know uh, uh, the, the 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 it's obvious that people themselves are not in a condition to. Uh, freely operate. Jesse, with with Lisa McPherson, when you became an expert witness in the case against the church, correct? Correct. And when you see the size of the church and their legal unlimited legal budget, you knew what you were up against because you had been on that side, the other side. Yeah, I had been on the other side of it, but you know. There were so many factors of why that case went off the rails. Um, one of them uh, specifically being that it just did not stay focused. That case started a movement. That that case got anonymous, excited, and protesting and raising hell. I mean, just awareness of what Scientology had did to Lisa McPherson what they what the Scientology had done to the Lisa McPherson Trust, the people of the trust, that excited and ignited uh anonymous people to 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 form and act against Scientology, you know. But cer it certainly did. Uh the Lisa McPherson's death was a watershed moment because it really showed how the Church of Scientology could kill a person and then claim religious protection and spend some, perhaps a hundred million dollars, I think is what Marty Rathbun has quoted, defending itself. Right. And the things that stood out to me about Lisa's death is defend the leader at any cost. Miscavige was actually in trouble. Wasn't at one point he named in uh, potential criminal charges? You know, I didn't work on the criminal case. I had nothing to do with the criminal case. I only worked in the civil case. By the time I came on the scene, the criminal case was over. But that's an interesting um, subject there of how Joan Woods and how they compromise the lead prosecutor with his alcoholism. You know, they, they got to him. They use, you know, his own personal shit against him and ended up getting that case dropped after spending tons of money. Well, well Miscavige spent years fighting the IRS, and I guess he learned a lot of valuable lessons about how to get into the heads of key people using unlimited legal resources and money. I think his lawyers figured that out. I don't think there's, there's anything he figured out, but I think his his lawyers, smart Harvard and Yale lawyers, figured it out. 
you know, where there's something something to be said for just uh, wearing down the other side through private investigators, endless money, endless motions. The, the civil case was wrongful death, correct? That's right. And the estate of Lisa McPherson, did the church try to get you disqualified as, as an expert witness? Over and over again, and it never worked. They've tried to get me disqualified in every case that I've ever been a part of, and it never worked. And, and they try to do it with, with uh, Mike Render and Marty Rathbun as well. Is that their standard playbook? You know, I'm not sure. But, you know, I, and I'm not, sh you, you know, these these people talking about expert witness. My whole expert witness testimony was an expert on the Scientology technology, on the, the application, the principles, the, the subject itself. It wasn't an expert because... Because I held, uh, you know, I was the public relations person or I was the other person, so I'm an expert. No, it was in the subject itself, and that's what I testified about. I didn't really testify about personalities or, you know, things the organization did. I testified on the technology itself. I, and, and, uh, and, and the other instance where I testified, I testified uh, in a copyright case with Lawrence Wallersheim about them um, lying about registering the copyrights. In other words, I used the materials themselves, wh whatever the Scientology material was, to show either they were either doing it wrong or they were lying about what they were doing. So I, I took the technology itself and used that as my forum to uh, work on a case. It wasn't opinion or uh, performance or any of that. And that started when I was in Scientology, when, when they offered me as an expert on the technology in the David Mayo case. Oh, what happened there? They, uh, well, uh, David Mayo lost, temporarily lost that case. You know, <laughs> it was like, I've worked both sides of that fence. But one thing that has happened, I've never lost a case ever, ever that I've ever been in uh, is always Scientology, open that person, settle it, never just outright lost the case. My expertise was the tech itself, the subject itself. I knew the HCLBs, I knew the policy letters, and that's what I used to educate the court with. It wasn't, you know, well, my personal knowledge is blah, blah, blah. No, I know the essence. I know the subject itself, and I can interpret it for you, for the court, so that you, you understand what's going on here. And that's, that was my position as an expert witness. Jesse, what did you see as the long-term fallout of Lisa McPherson? What, what things do you notice? Well, how did it change the church or its leadership? I think what happened as part of the fallout from Lisa McPherson is, is they do not even try to handle cases where people have, are having a psychotic break. They, I don't think that they lock people up anymore. They, they don't bring them on church property. They're not, they, I, I think that stopped the practice of introspection rundown in Scientology, period. I mean, they will do it off property. You know, at some sign, I've heard about it happening where, you know, they're doing it in some Scientologist's home. Maybe an auditor will come and try to do it and they have, you know, non serial member people watching them and, and that kind of thing. But as far as introspection within Scientology itself, I think that that case ended that practice. And then it turned into, you know, I've heard the term baby watch. Yeah. Where there were, uh, you know, private homes, they would do it in when someone flipped out. Jesse, what is it about Scientology auditing? Many people claim benefits out of it, but some people are very damaged by it. Well, what, what's going on with it? I, as far as the, the technology, the auditing itself, I mean, it, it, it's the basis of that stuff is psychology and psychiatry you know, in one form or another. Those are the people that L. Ron were, was hanging out with. That was his crowd. You know, people were doing that back in the 50s, and they were 
I mean, even Dianetics was something that was done in the Army prior to Elrond. People were, were, were recalling, you know, moments of trauma. So that was the fashion. That was kind of like what was going on back then. And, um, and then Elrond, you know, t stole a little part of it and, and focused on it, and, and he, you know, denounced the rest of it. But in and of itself, it's the same. It's talk therapy, you know, which has, has helped people in psychology and psychiatry for sure, you know, where they go in and they express themselves one way or the other, how they feel about something. And, then, and that happens in life when two people that disagree, if they just – sit down and fucking respect one another and talk, you know, talking brings relief. And that's going to work whether or not it's in psychology or Scientology or any other situation where talking helps. The only, the difference between uh, psychology and psychiatry as far as talk therapy is concerned is psychology doesn't tell people through talk therapy that they're going to become an uh, all-powerful being or it's going to clear their mind or some crazy shit. You know, it, it's just talk therapy, you feel better, and you move on. Now, sh shifting gears, we've been talking about Tom Cruise. Uh-huh. He, he, Tom Cruise has been in the news quite a bit after Alex Gibney's HBO documentary, Going Clear. Yeah. Some people have said that Tom Cruise is now the number two guy, and, uh, you know, there's a... So, you know, he, he takes plenty of heat for being in Scientology. You met Scient uh, Tom Cruise when he was fairly new Scientologist. Well, I met Tom Cruise when he was divorcing Mimi Rogers. And um, Days of Thunder, I think that movie had just come out. Days of Thunder had just come out. And then he was in the middle of also shooting that film with, that he did with Nicole Kidman, the first one where they fell in love and all that crap. But that's when I met him, and I tell you, he was nothing like what I've since read, how he is. He, he, he was a really nice, sweet person, very kind, very observant of other people, and uh, kind of shy, but um, interesting, you know, charismatic kind of person. And he, he just seemed happy. He was he's a he's a joyful person and uh, uh you know to see what he's become is is just uh amazing what do you think what do you think was uh, the attraction of Scientology for tom cruise was it he has said it he has handled his dyslexia well i I think that Tom Cruise doesn't realize what the hell has happened to him number one he was targeted very specifically to be reeled in, you know, because of his stature, because of his money, <clears throat> Miscavige, Greg Wilhere, you know, Ray Medoff, whatever technical people, they have gotten in his head using Scientology materials. They carefully write reports of what he likes, what he's talking about, what he does. This information goes to Miscavige. Suddenly, you know, it appears, you know, whatever Tom th is thinking is happening around him, it seems like. He's in a magical place, but that's because they're using his own information on him to uh, to guide, direct, and manipulate him. And um, I mean, it's, it's just like he doesn't stand a chance. How could you be uh, this in an intelligence organization? They know everything about you. You know nothing about what the hell is really going on. But everyone seems to know everything about you. And then now suddenly he's like. Also, but to me, it seems like Miscavige is doing whatever he can to drag someone down with him. I think that Miscavige realizes that he's in trouble legally. He his, his, he is he will soon have troubles with the law, and uh, he wants someone to drag the hell with him. Well, if, if David Miscavige wants to drag down Tom Cruise with him, this is an interesting echo of what you told me in our last interview that. When you sec check David Miscavige at the orders of L. Ron Hubbard, yeah. David Miscavige said, well, if I'm going to be sec checked, uh, I'm going to tell you all about Pop Broker, and I'm going to take down everyone else with me. That's right. If I go down, everybody else is going down, too. And that, that was his modus operandi. That's what he did. 
He told everything about Pat Broker and the shit that he was doing, and it made it impossible <laughs> for him to just receive him on himself. And, um, yeah, I think that that's – I think if, if he could get – the government or, or, or some agency attacking Tom, that he stands a better ch chance of overcoming that than him by himself. Hmm, that's interesting. According to uh, what Marty Rathbun has written, uh, the Church of Scientology engineered the divorce of Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. And Mimi Rogers before that. Okay. Uh, uh, so they control his life to the degree that they can engineer a divorce. Right. Now, as I follow Tom Cruise, uh, his career in Scientology, through, through things I've read and, you know, accounts of people who've worked with him, he becomes very radicalized after his divorce from Nicole Kidman. And what I mean by that, he becomes radicalized by the Church of Scientology. Yeah. And the reason I mentioned the radicalization of Tom Cruise, it's in the news now with uh, young Islamic men becoming radicalized. Yeah. And I saw it in the Christian church, so you could become very radicalized. And where I want to go, Jesse, I stayed home from work to watch Tom Cruise on uh, Oprah. And when I saw him jumping the couch... I thought this this is not adult behavior. It's not even Scientology behavior, as I understood Scientology. It's Lisa McPherson behavior. <clears throat> oh my! Oh my God! It is Lisa McPherson behavior. Yeah, I, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking Tom Cruise is the next Lisa McPherson. He, he he is going to hit that point when that cognitive he, he he you know, and I don't know if that's when the government steps in and tries to start arresting people. But something is going to happen, and, and it's going to tip him. <clears throat> you know, the the fact of the matter is, everyone who leaves Scientology experiences a little head blowing up, a little explosions. Someone said this to me uh, recently. You know, and I think Tom, when he goes through the transition of, of realizing, hey, maybe this isn't all it was meant to be, it, it's, it's going to affect him very heavily. Yeah, and going back to your remark is just blew my mind that uh, his behavior on Oprah was Lisa McPherson behavior. That makes sense to me because a short time later, he is on TV with Matt Lauer attacking psychiatric drugs, Brooke Shields, the right of you know of a woman to choose her own health care. He was never like and that before. That's Lisa McPherson behavior. Yeah. I mean, just change out of character. And that's what I mean by Lisa McPherson. I mean, it's doing something totally out of character, just strange, odd behavior. It seems like what has happened is is that every auditing process, every thought Tom Cruise had has been given to Miscavige. He seems to know everything about the guy. You know, he, he, he goes in session and he, he tries to relieve himself. All of that is being processed and used against him to manipulate him. And, and that's what's wrong with him. Not that he has an identity crisis. It's that he has really been fucked with so bad that <laughs> this is what happens. And Tom's not aware of the degree of... Manipulation. No, because Miscavige, it's an unequal relationship. Miscavige can read all of Tom Cruise's secret confession session data. Exactly. And, and Tom Cruise doesn't get to know anything about David Miscavige. Exa or anyone else. Oh, you, but you if, say it very well. You know, if they lift him up, well, now he's going to start being able to get other person's personal uh, PC folder data or privilege information or file information. You know, he'll start, be, oh, if he hasn't already, you know, become privileged to that information. Oh, I see. So Tom Cruise, they might feed him data on other people in order to manipulate him. Oh, well, let him see, you know, feel the power of of having that control, that, that kind of... I mean, can you imagine Tom Cruise having other celebrity folders brought to him so that he can read what they're doing, who their agents are, who, who they're fucking with, what their transgressions are? I mean, that's kind of what they do. 
So then that that would help to explain his remark he uh, allegedly made to Katie Holmes. He said, you don't understand. There's L. Ron Hubbard, there's David Miscavige, and then there's me. Yeah. Jesse, the concept of the big being, Scientology uses the word that there's big beings. Uh -huh. What is a big being in Scientology? What does it mean? Well, in, in my experience, it means that someone... It's like uh, that Zimbardo experiment, the Stanford experiment, experiment. Everyone goes into Scientology as a prisoner, and then they become a guard. <laughs> and then they, mm. you know, and they got to the, And that's what's happened to Tom. You know, he's he 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 was systematically targeted because of who he is. He's been manipulated. He doesn't even understand the degree of how they manipulated him and used his own personal information to coerce him. But he is under that, and, and he's acting out. He it would not be unfair to say that Tom Cruise was radicalized by Scientology. Completely. And what did they want to radicalize him for, or is that just what the church wants to do to every Scientologist, radicalize well, that's them? That's part of this celebrity program, you know. L. Ron had a, a program for celebrities specifically. And what he wanted is was to bring them into Scientology, make them all happy, happy with Scientology, and then use them as mouthpieces for inroads into all areas of society, whether it be government, film, or, or whatever. Use them as opinion leaders to, you know, over, to gain favor with the masses. A question I'm asked often, Jesse, is why does Scientology have such great appeal to celebrities? What, what is what is its uh, surreptitious methods it uses? Why are celebrities attracted to this practice? Connections, uh, facilitators. Scientology facilitates celebrities in every way. You know, uh, just besides taking their money, they're at their beck and call. You know, they give them all the attention that they need, plus the auditing. The auditing itself becomes addictive. You know, uh, instead of confronting problems in the real world or, or doing something, you can just go have a session and talk to somebody else about it and hope you get better type of thing. You know what I mean? It's, it, 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 to me, the auditing itself is debilitating over time. Too much, you know, too much of anything will, will screw you up and, and to me, there's a certain point where the auditing itself, but no matter how good it is, is debilitating because the person is addicted to it. When you become reliant upon it. Uh, one story I heard, uh, true or false, I'd like to ask you about early in Tom Cruise's Scientology career. You know, he, he became wealthy and famous at a young age. And he came from a, you know, a fairly poor background. Yeah. So he didn't know how to be wealthy that, you know, and, and he, you know, he had a house and he had some uh, housekeepers and staff. Right. Mm -hmm. And he, he really wasn't, it just wasn't cutting it. And then he sees David Miscavige's world with snap and pop Sea Org members who duplicate, get stuff done. Perfect. White glove, clean, instant compliance. Yes, sir. And he's really impressed and he wants that kind of household help. So what does David Miscavige do? He puts in Sea Org members to be Tom's household staff. Yeah. I mean, did it happen? Did it go down that way? Well, uh, all I can speak about is what I know personally. And yeah, please. When, and when Tom Cruise came in and he was divorcing Mimi Rogers, he had no clue of how to get a divorce, how he should separate the money, uh, what type of an attorney he needed to hire. What he, he, he was confused about what to start doing with all the money he had. He, he needed uh, advice about investing. And Lyman Spurlock, L. Ron Herbert's accountant, took that over and started helping Tom manage his money. What's happened uh, since then, I can, you know, I, I don't know. But I do know back then he had those confusions. He needed those services. And that was done from him for him on a very high special level they helped him helped him negotiate the settlement with Mimi uh, did the non you know they taught him all of this shit you know how to do the non disclosures wh what you can get away with what words to say he learned all of these things 
through Miscavige. So they really give him VIP service. Yeah. And and this is sort of that uh, mafia relationship where the mafia does something to help you out. You're indebted to them. Correct. And not only that, but they know your deepest secrets. They know your secrets. They know where you live. They know where the money is. They know what you've done. <laughs> and you've got so a handler standing right in your house in case you get out of line. So his household staff is is keeping David Miscavige informed literally hourly of what Tom said, did, think. Exactly. If who he's talking to, uh, what, what the hell are they talking about? What is his attention on, you know, who, who's doing what? Yes, they know. So that they predict, and it's kind of like, and then so Tom lives in a dream world. Everything that he could possibly think or want just appears. It's not, it would seem to him that he's manifesting maybe OT powers. Oh, yeah, that's, that's exactly. He probably thinks he has fucking OT powers. <laughs> when, when in fact it's an engineer Truman show. Exactly. He's just being manipulated. You know, it, you know, when I heard him selling all the properties that he had and, you know, getting rid of all the money. And, and then also what was disturbing to me in the Ron McScavage Sr. case, when that private investigator said that the money was coming from Tom Cruise, stupid ass. So, you know, how would this guy know that? I, they don't make that up. You know, this. This uh, guy, that's what he told the investigators, the prosecutors, that the, that he was told the money was, it was Tom Cruise money. So what the fuck? Yeah, and that, you know, that could be, uh, I took that to mean a figure of speech or alternately to keep it out of uh, 501c3 tax exempt monies. Tom was uh, funding the effort as a favor to David Miscavige. Well, that would sure make his ass liable for a lawsuit. You know? Well, we don't. Yeah, we don't know that, and I'm not saying anything. It's just an interesting remark by a private investigator who was arrested, and really, these two PIs, this father-son team, they had a silencer, which is a 10-year felony in the United States. Right. And I'm sure they had to do a lot of talking to get out of 10 years in the federal penitentiary. I'm sure them people want to have a bunch of fucking questions about Scientology that uh, we don't know about. <laughs> but, but, but. You know, this is why I think, you know, when the blind side comes from Miscavige, when, because that's the way it was going from Elrond, he just didn't have a fucking clue until the last minute, and it was too late. But, he, you know, he keeps doing these illegal things. He keeps thinking he's going to get away, get away. That's what Elrond thought. I'm never going to pay taxes. I can keep getting away and, you know, and nothing to nerves and blah, 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 and, and Miscavige is doing all the same shit. With their Norman using the church money for personal uh, gain and personal vendetta and blah, blah, blah. I mean, of course, Miscavige, uh, after Squirrel Busters, which I think was a, just a catastrophically bad move, it, it was like a horrible idea. And you would think he would stop, but no, he, he has his own father followed. And, you know, he continues to persist in his lawlessness. Jesse, what value does Tom Cruise have to David Miscavige right now? Uh, star power. Star power. I think he totally wants someone to attach himself to for when his ass, when he comes down on him. He wants to drag someone with him. He wants to position himself with someone that may help him stay out of the fire. So really, Miscavige is saying, hey, look, if uh, Tom Cruise is a Scientologist, I can't be that bad. Is it something like that? No, I think it's like Tom Cruise. Uh, I think he wants Tom Cruise to have a hand in management and directing Scientology so that when they come for his ass, they have to come for somebody else, too. I think he literally wants to drag someone to hell with him. And, I, and the more important, the better. You know, I think he figures his chances will be better if he has a well-known or some kind of star power or, or something. Because, I mean, they use those celebs to, to get what they want. They use them celebs to coerce uh, police officers. They use them to coerce judges, you know, public opinion or whatever. And I think that he just wants to attach himself to a celeb so that when the fire comes to light his little ass up, 
that he'll stand a better chance being associated with a, a well-known and liked person. Now, you said you made a provocative remark that Tom Cruise is the next Lisa McPherson. Yeah, because his mind isn't right. Yeah, I, don't, it, I mean, he is like so delusional at this point. I mean, it, it, it's 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 like that. I mean, when I look at, at Leah's book, he's calling people DB and 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 all this kind of shit. I mean, all all of those are fantasy terms. That's Elrond fantasy stuff. And 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 when I think of Lisa McPherson. After, you know, studying her folders, you start to see she was doing little off things like she had went and gotten someone's face loudly at, that she didn't even know, you know, uh, uh, expressing a, an opinion. All of this was kind of going on days before she stripped and walked down the street naked. And so she'd be the, that, that radical, I'm going to put your ethics in even if I don't know you. Exactly. Hey. Exactly. She just started doing, but, and you know, Tom could have been really close from when he was jumping up and down on that damn couch, you know, acting, acting crazy. He was probably pretty close then, but, um, well, this is where, well, this is why Leah Remini's book troublemaker, I highly recommend people read it. If they haven't, she talks about Tom Cruise. I, I'm not going to give anything away in the book, but, uh, interesting insights into, into when Scientology target someone it comes at a very steep price the church's favors yeah tom's last movie mission impossible uh rogue nation mm -hmm. you you saw the same old pat kingsley pr method go into play tom controlled his press you couldn't ask him about scientology katie holmes or anything if you wanted to interview him right and that showed that the church is back in controlling his PR and controlling access to him. And they're, again, he's being isolated. Yeah. Uh, he's being cut off and isolated and controlled, and he's not willing to talk about Scientology. So he's got himself painted in a corner. Do you see Tom Cruise leaving the church, Jesse? Uh, not, with, not with his sanity. No. Hmm. Is he in a position to leave the church with what, what Miscavige has on him? I don't think so. I think he's sold all of his property. I think he's given so much money to Scientology at this point that he's um, he's bought into it. He's literally bought in, into it. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Well, it'll soon be interesting to watch events play out. We're, we're here in... Uh, November 2015, and going into 2016, what do you see happening for the Church of Scientology after a horrible 2015? What, what happens in 2016, Jesse? What do you see? I see more of the same. I see, um, well, you know, from the good work that you do, I think when people start to realize just how unauthorized Miscavige is, maybe they will come out of apathy about their religion, Scientology, you know, and um, decide to no longer support Miscavige and, you know, do something to take their religion back from him and uh, maybe get someone who who can lead the Scientology and bring it into the 21st century by getting rid of disconnection and a few uh, other horrible things, which it doesn't need at this point. Scientology is it's not going to go anywhere, and, and, and it's big enough. It's, it's been around for decades now. I, I think that um, it wouldn't be – it it can be just like anything else. Uh, it, but at the rate it's going now, it's nothing more than a criminal gangster organization, obvious criminal gangster organization. I agree wholeheartedly, and, and, and its present trajectory is going to crater and crater hard. I've said in the past that cults end badly, and the Church of Scientology will be no exception. I, I personally don't know that the Church can change its lawless ways, nor does it want to. Well, I think that uh, David Miscavige will end before Scientology does. Okay. We'll... Miscavige is not Scientology. He's just... He's just uh, at the reins right now, but Scientology is so much more than he is, and this is why he's having so much trouble with it. 
And you know, the the fact that the, the matter is is the movement Scientology as a movement itself is still suffering from the loss of its leader. You know, it's it's still suffering from the loss of the, the creator, the person that that you know gave them courses to do that they felt they were getting better, that gave them auditing rundowns and processes that gave them hope for eternal or immortality or whatever. I think Scientology is is suffering the loss of that still, and uh, and 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 Miscavige has been what's called like a camouflage hole. There's no way that he can he can take that he can fill that void, and uh, it'll be it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Jesse, you said two insightful things. One. David Miscavige will end before the Church of Scientology. Two, and what I think is very insightful is that the Church is still suffering the loss of its leader, L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. No one ever replaced him. Never. And in other traditions, you have rabbinical commentary, scholars, church fathers. You have a, a group of people who continue the Founder's work expand upon it, expound upon it, uh, you know, and all of that is completely absent. Scientology, as I've said before, doesn't even have apologetics, a defense of the faith. Right. They can't say who they are or what they are. They don't even have a spokesman to put in front of a camera. Right. So I see, you know, I asked Mike Rinder this last year, and he gave an, a, a great answer. I said, Mike, what do you see for 2015? He said, well, before one fight, they asked Muhammad Ali, what do you see for the fight ahead? And Ali said, pain. And it was such a great classic Mike Rinder answer, pain. Yeah. And the thing is, the church is bringing it upon itself. It's all preventable. It's all avoidable. You could yeah, cancel. And, and that's what Miscavige yeah. is doing. And that's why I, I say that Miscavige will end before Scientology does. And I think that's a great place to end, Jesse. I really appreciate talking to you. You have some very rare insights into the church. Look forward to having you on again. Well, and, uh, I'm, I'm still finishing up my little project here, and um, I've been I've been kind of going going at it alone. No, I understand, Jesse. That the uh, I, I think people who are able to donate to help you finish your book on Scientology should by all means make a donation. My primary reason for doing anything uh, in the last decade was Lisa McPherson to know that they actually killed someone uh, using that introspection rundown procedure personally affected me because of my own personal experience with the introspection. I know that that didn't have to happen. You know, if someone cared for Lisa McPherson or if someone had an ounce of empathy for her, that didn't have to happen, but no one did. A perfectly healthy woman was dead in 17 days at the hands of of uh, Miscavige's technology. And to me, that will always be a tragedy, and it will always be a reason for me to speak the truth about what I know about David Miscavige and his Scientology. Jesse, I look forward to being one of the people to interview you when your book's released. And I think it's going to be a big book. Thank you for listening to Surviving Scientology Radio. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.